Hi, I'm Kathy Lunsford. I've been a member of North Fulton Master Gardeners for about two and a half years. Um, my interest is in vermicomposting. You might say vermicomposting, what is that? It is also known as composting with worms. Uh, vermicomposting has been around for a long time, but it's just recently gained um, importance in the last 20 years. We're gonna talk about some fun facts, food scraps, junk mail, and paper products. Did you know that they make up about 30% of garbage? The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that less than 3% of food waste is being recycled, compared to 62% of paper and cardboard. Have you ever felt concerned about the environment? And have you ever wondered what you might be able to do to help? Well, Vermicomposting may be an easy and fun solution. Vermicomposting is using earthworms to convert your kitchen scraps into a nutrient-rich humus-like material known as vermicompost or worm castings. Oh yes, or worm poo. Compared to traditional compost bin or pile, vermicomposting excludes undesirable animals to access the waste. It takes less space and it occurs more rapidly than the traditional pile or bin outdoors. It requires less labor and it provides up to 4% more nitrogen in the final compost than traditional hot compost. Benefits of vermicomposting. Vermicomposting provides nutritious amendments for your soil. It enhances soil structure, enhances soil moisture retention and drainage, and it boosts nutrients available to your plants. It contains microbes that help plants grow bigger and helps plants produce higher yields. It also reduces the impact of some pests and diseases and the best benefit, if you are vermicomposting, you will have plenty of worms for fishing. If you love fishing, this is the hobby for you. I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you what you will need if you are interested in vermicomposting. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things we'll need, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that you can use to, uh, to uh, start vermicomposting. This is the final um, product. This is called vermicompost and it is worm poo. Many people call it black gold. If you put it out in your hand, it's very, very, very soft, dark, looks like black gold, but it is a wonderful nutrient for your plants. And we can also make something called worm tea, which I'll talk about a little later. Not something that you would want to serve at your tea party. Um, but just as if you were going to get a new pet, a dog or a cat or a horse or a cow or whatever, you're gonna have to think about some things before you get it. You're gonna have to know where it's going to live. And you're gonna have to know what it needs to sleep or what kind of water it needs. You're gonna to need to know how to get started with that pet before you actually get started. So I'm gonna go over a few of the things that you'll need. You'll need an earthworm bin. A bin is simply a, a place for your worms to stay, sort of like a house for them, like a dog house. You're gonna need bedding. Bedding is um, what you put in the house for them to sleep on. You're going to need water. And you're gonna, of course, in the, when you get all this ready, you're gonna need your composting earthworms. We're gonna talk about what kind of worms that you will use in your uh, worm composting. You're gonna need food scraps because they are going to eat your table scraps. That is your contribution to the environment. And that you'll need some form of grit. That can also be in the form of table scraps. Um, or it can be other types of grit. We'll talk about that a little bit. So these are some of the things that we're going to discuss that you might need. Uh, 
not going ahead, not going ahead. Okay, as far as it's not moving. Okay, types of bins. There are different types of bins that you can use. This is places where you're going to keep your um, worms. You're going to need a place to keep them. You can keep them in your garage, in your basement. And in this picture, it indicates that this person kept it in their kitchen. I have heard of people keeping them in their pantry. I've heard of people keeping them in their um, under their desk at work and people at work would put their food scraps in after lunch. But you can purchase commercial manufactured bins, um, some called stackables or uh, feed throughs that you can um, put the worms in the top or put the food in the top and the worms in the bottom and they'll crawl up to get the food. That's one type of bin. Another, you can build from untreated wood, make sure you use untreated wood, but you can build your own. You can use almost any dark colored plastic container. Um, typical 14 to 18 gallon storage, something about this size um, that you can buy at Target or any place that sells uh, bins. And then you will need to put air holes in them because your worms need air. The holes in this one were put with a 3 8 inch drill. We put holes in the top and then we put a few holes around the sides just so that they have air. Uh, contrary to com common belief, I do not put holes in the bottom. Some people might tell you that you need to do that, but I do not put holes in the bottom uh, for several reasons that we won't go into right now, but you can manage your worm bin without doing that. Um, types of bedding, what you're going to put into your bin, once you decide what you're going to use for a bin, you would start with shredded newspaper. You're going to avoid glossy paper like your magazines. You can tear up shredded cardboard. And we use something called Coco Core. Coco Core is, this is Coco Core. And it is, um, you water it down and it's just a nice soft um, bedding. It comes in a brick like this. It comes in a brick. It's called Echo Earth. You can get it at your pet stores. Most pet stores have it now. Even some plant stores have it because it is becoming popular um, to use on your plants. But if not, you can order it online. You can find it many places now. It's uh, the hair off of a coconut. And I mix it with the newspaper. This shredded newspaper, I'm not sure if I can show you this, but I mix it with newspaper. And this is where you might want to get the kids involved. Put cocoa core. Okay, you put cocoa core on top of the newspaper and then just stir it up. And it will, the cocoa core will adhere to the newspaper and it will make, um, it will keep the newspaper from balling up. You also um, can put in your bin as bedding, you can use peat moss, but it must be leached or it'll be too acidic for the worms. You can throw in some drier lint, a handful of garden soil. Um, I've even used cottonseed hulls. I have a hard time finding those in Georgia. I had to go to Alabama to get some, but you can use cottonseed hulls. The one thing to remember is that your bedding should be light and airy, and it should be able to absorb water. Um, worms need 70% moisture in order to breathe. So if you wet your cocoa core and uh, mix it in with your newspaper, it might be wet enough. You, the way you tell if it's ready, you pick it up and squeeze it, and it should be like a moist sponge. Um, you don't want water to drip out of it, but you do want it to be moist. And if your bedding becomes too dry, then you use a spray bottle and spray it. You don't want to just pour water in there because it's not going to all be absorbed. It's going to run to the bottom of your bin and cause you problems with your bin being a little too wet. If it is too wet, 
um, you can add extra dry bedding to take up the excessive water. Uh, but you want to make sure that you um, test it to see that water doesn't squeeze out of it so that it's not too wet. Um, you're going to have some problems, um, common problems, too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold. And um, if your bedding does not smell, um, if, if it has a nasty smell or begins to smell bad, you've probably got a problem because your bedding should never um, smell like anything except um, good earth. It should have a good earthy smell. So if it gets too wet, again, we said you can add extra bedding, extra newspaper to absorb the water. If it's too dry, you can spray it. If it gets too hot, you, there are several things you can do. Um, you can put some ice cubes on the top. You can put water in a uh, drink bottle and bury it in there until it cools off. If it's too cold, you can wrap the outside of your bin with um, some type of wool or some type of insulation until it um, gets warmer. But um, those would be your common problems. The, I've talked to several people who are, have been involved with vermicomposting and the most common problem that people have is that they um, let it get too wet. And that is one of the hardest problems to solve. But if it's too wet, either put dry newspaper on the top to absorb some of the water dig a hole in the corner and put more shredded newspaper in the corners to absorb some of the water that will run to the corners. Um, you can um, uh, turn it on its side if you want to and let the extra moisture run out of some of the holes that you have on the sides. So there are several things you can do, but that probably would be more common than being too dry. If it's too dry, it's relatively easy to spray it or make it um, a little bit wetter. Again, you're gonna to need to use worms and people will say, well, can I go out in my yard and just collect the worms that I find out there after the rain? Well, I wanted to um, say those kinds of worms won't live in your vermicomposting bin. Those types of worms, um, are good for your garden, they're good for your yard, but they are not good for vermicomposting. And I'll tell you why. There are thousands of varieties of common earthworm, but only about seven of those varieties are considered suitable for vermicomposting. The most adaptable and the most readily available are worms called Icenia fetida, also known, and you probably know them as red wigglers manure worms or tiger worms. Red worms make the best compost, um, composting worms. So you wanna um, start with red worms. Uh, characteristics of your red wigglers. The characteristics are they eat, they poop, and they make babies. And this is exactly what you want in your bin. You want them to eat your scraps, you want them to poop so you'll have that wonderful black gold, and you also want them to multiply so you'll have extra worms to give your friends or go fishing or start another bin. One thing to remember is that a worm can consume half of its weight in food every day. So if you start with most generally in a 14 to 18 gallon container, you would start with about um, uh, a thousand worms and you would order those. You would not get those from your uh, places that sell worms for fishing. You would order those online or, or get them from somebody else who is uh, working with vermicomposting. I'm sure they have extras. That means that you need, uh, if they consume half of their weight in food per day, well a pound, a thousand worms weighs about a pound that they don't count them when you get them, they send you a pound and that's how they're counted. So if that's true, they need about, um, what, 
three pounds of food a week, roughly. So you need to think about that when you uh, go to feed them. But also remember that they are eating their bedding. They're constantly eating through the newspaper, the core. They're making poo out of everything that's in there. Because when you get ready to harvest, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, you want um, mostly poo. You don't want any of that paper to be left in there. You don't want any of that core to be left in there. And you don't want any of your food to be left in there. So um, think about that when you're um, feeding them, that they're also eating what's, what they have. So you don't want to measure out three pounds of food a week. And just, um, this is something else I, I need to add in. It's good to feed them only once a week. You don't want to feed them every day. Not that you can't, but if you check where you fed them last and there's still food there, then you don't want to add food because you don't want to overfeed them. Wait a few days, go back, check again, and there should, it should be time to feed them. But uh, you don't want to overfeed them. But if you go and you dig where you put the food the first time, then if it's gone, it's time to feed them again. Worms um, require 70% moisture to breathe. We've talked about that. Um, they do need moisture in their bin. That can also be controlled by what you feed them. We'll talk about that in just a minute also. They, they do best in temperatures of 60 to 85 degrees. They will survive in about 40 to 90 degrees, but they don't, um, they don't reproduce as well. They don't, they don't do their work as well if it gets below 60 or above 85. Um, so if it gets really hot, I don't think that it will kill them, but you need to um, either do something to cool your bin off a little bit or um, if you want them, if you want to keep on, if you want them to keep on providing the compost or castings for you. They need an acidity of, with a pH of about six to eight. I never really measure the um, pH of my bin, but you can sort of consider that too when you feed them. Are you feeding them very acidic foods? You don't want to feed them acidic foods. You can buy, um, I have found over the years that I like to buy these little toys. Um, this is a moisture pH meter and you can put that in your bin and it will tell you the pH and it will tell you the moisture level. And if you, uh, if you wanna, if, if the pH is too high or too low, you can sort of control that by what you feed them. And the same with moisture, you can control that in your bin. You have some control over your bin. I also have a thermometer that I bought that is, uh, you just put that down in your bin and it will tell you the temperature of your bin. And remember the temperature inside your bin is not always the same as the temperature outside the bin because it's in the bin, it's uh, got some moisture in it. It's not always the same. Most people say if you're comfortable, the worms are comfortable. Um, I guess you could go by that. If you get really cold, they might be cold. But um, basically, if you want to measure the temperature, you can. I haven't always done that. I've just recently already buying little uh, trinkets like that to help. Not sure that it does. And we've talked about their bedding. We haven't talked about what to feed them. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Surface area. A thousand worms will fit in a surface area of about um, one by two square, uh, square foot. So if you have one of these tubs, you could probably even get 2,000 worms in it because that's another thing about red wigglers. They live within the top six inches of your soil. So um, that's why you need the surface area for the worms. So you, wouldn't, you could start in a shoebox this size. You could start. And I know one man who did. He was entertaining his grandchildren and they started really with a tennis ball can and then they moved to when they uh, produced more worms they moved to something like this. If you use a clear container you really would need to put some black paper around it because worms like darkness. They don't have eyes but they sense light and they, uh, they don't like light 
So you want to buy, a, when you buy your bin, you want to buy one that's colored and not clear plastic. You need something that's darker. Um, so that, that takes the darkness. They, um, they need darkness. Okay, let's see. Feeding your worms, things to consider when you feed them, chopping or grinding your food scraps. I do chop mine in the food processor. You don't have to. I do know people who just take their lettuce scraps, carrot peels, whatever, and put it um, on the top uh, of the bin. Worms don't eat them as fast. They will eat your scraps, but they won't eat them as fast as if you chop them up. And you don't necessarily have to put them in the food processor. You can just chop them with a knife to about one by one pieces. You just don't want anything really big that's gonna take them a long time to eat because the more they eat, the more you're contributing to the ecology. And also um, the, the faster you're gonna get rewards pH of food scraps. Again, we talked a little bit about pH, but you have to be careful. You want the pH of your food scraps to be between six and eight. Um, liquid content, you don't want to put a lot of liquid in your food. Coffee grounds are great. They love coffee grounds. And some cooked foods also will add extra moisture to the bin. So just be careful if you're feeding them a lot of coffee grounds you might want to put more dry newspaper. When you feed your worms, you're going to dig a hole in your bin and put your food in there, and then you're going to cover it up. You never want to leave it open. So if you dig this hole and you put the food scraps in, if, if they look like they're going to be a problem with moisture and too much water, instead of covering them with what's already in the bin, I will take fresh shredded newspaper and cover the food with that, and that will soak up some of the moisture in your food. So again, you control what happens in your bin. You just have to have done it and experienced it and see what happens, and then you'll look for solutions and you'll find what works for you. Uh, when you feed your worms, consider the hardness. Anything that's really hard, they're not gonna eat right away. Um, and again, when you, uh, when you, uh, harvest you might have some things left in your bin that they haven't eaten some of them if it's too hard you might want to just throw it out or or put it in another bin to be eaten the next time um what do they eat they'll devour any kind of melon rind i use it as a treat if they're unhappy they love watermelon rind they like uh, honeydew rind they like uh, any kind of melon rind they eat food scraps any kind of peels, apple cores, um, coffee grounds. I do coffee filters also. I put those in my uh, food processor and grind them up a little bit and they, they'll eat those. They'll eat some fruits, but not citrus fruits. Citrus fruits, oranges, they, they like apples a lot, but oranges, lemons, things that are citrusy, you really don't want to include those. Um, they'll eat most vegetables, but not um, if they've had you don't want to give them vegetables that you've added spices or anything to. They don't like spices. They do eat ground up eggshells and the ground up eggshells are good to put in their bedding because this helps their gizzard. They have a gizzard like a bird and they don't have a stomach. So they need some type of grit, um, either a handful of uh, sand from your yard every now and then or ground up eggshells. And I purchased a, an inexpensive coffee bean grinder uh, five and a half years ago and it's still going and I every now and then we'll just take the eggshells that I have. I do put them in the microwave just to make sure that uh, any uh, thing that I don't want um, in my garden is there. I'll put them in the microwave for about 45 seconds, take them out, put them in the uh, coffee bean grinder and grind them up. But you can, if, if you want to just chop them up with a, a bottle or whatever you have to grind them up. I would wash them out a little bit first, just for safety's sake. Um, they will eat tea, they'll eat the tea bags, but make sure you take the staples out of your tea bags. You don't want to have the staples in there. Um, never feed your worms meat scraps or bones. Don't feed them fish, greasy or oily food, onions, 
some people say they feed them onions, but onions have an odor and then your bin will have an odor and you don't want it to. I don't feed them onions, uh, maybe the outside skins, but they don't eat those too quickly and those tend to be there when you harvest. So I don't feed them that. No fats, no tobacco, no salty food, no pet or human manure and no citrus or citrus peel. So um, harvesting the worms is the next thing you'll have to do. After a couple of months of them eating and reproducing in your bin, it will be time to harvest. I always ask myself, am I harvesting the castings or am I harvesting the worms? Because you're really just separating them. You're gonna start out with a whole new pile of worms and you're gonna put them in, a, in new bedding and you're also going to end up over here with um, four or five pounds, um, gallons, not pounds, gallons of castings. So there are different ways to do that, and I'm just going to run quickly through it. You can turn the worm bin over onto a plastic sheet, as you see in this picture, and have a strong light on top of it. The worms do not like light, so they will climb to the bottom of those piles might take them a little while. So while your worms are doing that, you're adding new, moisture, new bedding to your worm bin so that you'll be ready for the worms after they're separated. After about 10 minutes, begin scraping off the top layer of each pile. And as you do that, there'll be worms in the light and they will go down to the bottom, but you'll sift um, each of these stacks that you've just removed and you'll um, go back and by that time you can take off the tops again and you do this every 10 or 15 minutes until you get to the bottom. When you get to the bottom you'll find the worms in a cluster at the bottom of your stack and you just scoop up those worms and um, sometimes I put them in a bucket so that I can measure them or I mean weigh them before I put them back in my new bin, you can you don't have to do that, but if you wanna know, like if you know you started with a pound, you might sometimes end up with three pounds and it would just be nice to know that, to know that you have enough to share. Um, but you're gonna either return, and eventually you'll return them to new bedding anyway. So you've got worms and you've got castings, what a blessing. Um, so there's another method of harvesting called the side to side method. I don't find any one method better than another. A lot of people um, will withhold food for a few days so there's minimal food in the bin. They'll make fresh bedding and have it nearby and then they shift everything to one end of the bin and put fresh bedding at the other and they add fresh food to the fresh bedding and um, give the worms a few days to migrate from where they are to the food and then you'll have your castings on one side with still a few worms in it. But um, and then you can spread out your new bedding and a lot of people think that's easier. I've tried it. I don't think that it's easier, but that's up to you. There are other methods too that you can read about. Those are the two most common. Um, you'll find cocoons in your um, casting sometimes. Cocoons are fertilized egg sacs about three to six weeks after being deposited in the bedding, one to seven worms will hatch usually about two or three within six weeks, these worms can reproduce. And I just put this picture in there because for a, a year or more, I didn't know what the cocoons looked like. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because after you have um, harvested your castings, you're gonna have a few worms left in there. That's not gonna hurt your plants. And even if you don't, you're gonna have cocoons that have um, made their way through the screening or whatever you do with your castings and eventually they're going to hatch and you're going to have some worms in there. But um, I gave a lady next door some castings for her plants and the next time I saw her she said, Miss Lunsford, you know that the stuff you gave me for my plants? There was a worm in there. Well, good. I said, That's good for your plants. So you will have worms in there sometimes. Don't let that frighten you. It's good for your plants. Um, Worms will reproduce as they're eating your food. And ideally you want to reduce the total number back to the number you started with, but you can continue to increase them. Um, some people say eventually if they get too crowded, they'll take care of their own problems and they won't hatch quite as much. 
Use harvested worms though for fish bait or to create another worm bin for a friend. What does one do with worm compost after harvesting? Sprinkle it directly into the soil in your garden. When you're transplanting, add some directly into the bottom of the hole the plant is going into in order to give the roots extra nutrients. Use vermicompost during the growing season as a top dressing. Fertilize around the root area or drip line of your plant's shrubs or trees about a fourth or a half inch deep. And you can make worm tea. I think I said earlier we would talk about that. Uh, make sure you don't serve it at your tea party. Worm tea is not the water runoff from your worm bin. When, like I said, if your worm bin is too wet and you have to turn it on its side and let some of that run off, that is um, not something you want to put on your plants. You can, but it's, um, it's from the lechate family and it's, um, it is, has not been through the bodies of the worms and it is not beneficial to your plants like worm tea. So there is a difference. That is runoff from your food and um, extra water. But what you wanna use for tea is the beneficial bacteria and nutrients found in the worm poop. You wanna change it to liquid form. Good microbes and bacteria in the worm poop are transferred to the water you use to make the tea. Tea can then be sprayed on your plants. Can also be used to water your plants where the roots will have access to good bacteria and nutrients. And one of the reasons you might spray it is because if you spray it, it um, also um, will help sometimes to get rid of diseases and insects that are on your leaves. And you know, it's like fertilizing. You can't do it just once. You're gonna have to do it several times if you wanna see the real benefit of it. But uh, worm tea is great. And let's see. It can be used both in ground and container plants. It improves water retention, acts as a natural bug repellent for some garden pests, creates a healthy soil, can be used as an inoculant for bean, squash, and melon seeds before you plant them. But again, do not serve it at your tea party. Which of these three plants have not had a drink of compost tea? I'm sure you can tell. Um, my references, some of my favorite books, uh, Worms Eat My Garbage, The Worm Book, um, How to Start a Worm Bin, and Complete Guide to Working with Worms, and The Best Place for Garbage. Those are all great, and, um, but there are others out there. Um, these are just some of my favorites. And if you have questions, I wish that I could answer them for you because when I first started, I was looking and looking for somebody to answer my questions, and I found it in these books, so that's just a place for you to go. Website references are wonderful. Um, you can order your worms from many of these website uh, places and they also have good instructions, um, good answers for your problems and uh, just a good way to get started. And get to know your worms. Once you get to know your worms, you'll love them. People have told me it was the most fun um, pet that you could imagine, and it is fun once you get to know them. So we here we have our next generation worm farmer. Um, as I said at the beginning, I've been a master gardener for about two and a half years, and maybe you even said then, who are the master gardeners? The master gardeners support the North Fulton Demonstration Gardens. Uh, we provide scholarships, we provide children's gardening classes, um, our mission is really to provide horticulture education, service and inspiration in North Fulton community. For the past 21 years, we have partnered with Bullock Hall to bring a garden fair to the community on the last Saturday in April. And we provide garden, gardening education through gardening lecture series um, to the North Fulton communities of which this class is a part. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that you will be inspired to um, start or at least try vermicomposting now that you have more of an idea of what it's about. Um, is there another slide? Let's see here. That's it. Okay. One more slide. Thank you. One more slide. I, I thought so, but I can't find it. She says there's one more. Can you click it through? 
I don't know. There. Okay. Few, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Okay. Last, last slide, last bit of information for you. And again, I do hope you enjoyed that little, um, little bit of information about vermicomposting. The North Fulton Master Gardeners Par Partnership also with UGA Cooperative Extension in Fulton County. Um, and they are conducting a series of free classes to provide up-to-date horticulture programs. For information, you can go to, uh, you can go to our um, Facebook page, um, Twitter, Instagram, our webpage, and YouTube. Uh, again, we will reopen in-person community classes when it is safe to do so. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that this um, spring or fall. Hopefully we will be able to do that again soon. But again, all of these are listed here. If you want to um, take a look at our Facebook page, our Twitter page, we have Instagram in development. Hopefully you'll be able to go there soon. Um, go to our web page and our YouTube channel right now is, is just, um, just blooming and wonderful right now. It's growing and developing and um, I hope that you'll check out some of our other future classes. Kathy. Thank you again. Kathy. Yes. Kathy, I have one question that I wanted to ask. How do you make the, uh, the tea? I, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, can you can you explain just a little bit? I know that it's a water based, but uh, how do you get all the nutrients out of that worm poop into the tea? Okay. You, um, you can, it does need to be aerated. It is an aerated um, uh, uh, product. But what I like to do really for small amounts is just take a handful of castings and put them inside an old piece of hose, or this is a uh, cheesecloth, and tie it up, put a string around it, and tie it. And you would put it something about this size with only a couple of tablespoons. I would put it in uh, a pitcher about this size, a two quart pitcher, and fill it with water, um, preferably water that you've gotten from the rain or you've let it set out so that it doesn't have chlorine in it. You don't want chlorine in the water. And then you would take a stick and just stir it so that you can see it bubble. You know that's the air getting in there. And then um, you, you would do that for 24 hours, not necessarily while you sleep, but when you think about it, stir it every so often. And then take this out and this is ready to put on your plants. And so is this, just uh, untie it and put it on your plants. Um, to make a lot of tea, I make it in five gallon buckets. And I, I have a five gallon bucket. For a five gallon bucket, you want to use probably two cups of castings. And you would put them again in a um, old piece of hose or burlap or something that um, it can get through. And it's good to add a little molasses, <laughs> add a little um, organic molasses, maybe a tablespoon or a little bit of humic acid. Um, about the same amount, a tablespoon, just something to provide a little sugar for the um, nutrients that are um, in your tea. And the when I make five gallon buckets, we have an aerator with a uh, like a little uh, pump from a fish tank. And I put it in there and uh, uh, attach it to, um, I have I have a piece that I put in there and attach it to you would you have to probably look online and see um, where to get those or make your own but you want something that's going to put air into the water and I do that you can do it for 24 48 36 hours whenever you're ready to use it then you stop it but I will say this also um, that might be a, a whole nother class is how to make and use tea but tea um, you do need to use it right away because it is aerobic and it does its best work when it's aerobic. If you leave it, those uh, good bacteria and fungi and whatever are in it um, are gonna become anaerobic and it's gonna start to smell. And then you don't wanna put it on your plants. It is suggested that you use it in uh, at, least the, at least the first two hours after you make it. Um, again, you can, um, if you 
even if you make this much or if you make five gallons, you can uh, you can add that much water to it, 50-50 if, if you want to make more of it. It's probably strong, the stronger it is, the better it is, but you can dilute it and make more. I hope that answers a little bit your question. Thank you very That's much, Kathy, for the presentation.